Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. We are excited to be able to partner with Harmon on today's live event. We have got a special guest with us as well. We're going to do a quick round of introductions. Uh, I'd like to start out with Steve. Steve, would you like to do a quick introduction? Yes, Steve Bogart. I'm the solutions expert for the national account team. So great to be here today. Awesome. And our special guest, Bubba. Oh, thank you. I feel special being called a special guest. Hello and, and welcome everyone here. We're happy to talk about esports today. Awesome. Well, very good. All right. So I think we're going to kind of do like a, a panel discussion uh, for today's event. So we're looking forward to having some interaction as well as having uh, some live chat as well. So um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to uh, ask any questions in the chat room and we will go ahead and get started. So turn it over to you, gentlemen. Great. Thanks, Jay. So uh, Bubba, tell us a little bit about how you got started in esports. Well, I am a self-proclaimed nerd, uh, but also a, a college student athlete uh, years ago. And um, really how I got into esports was three years ago. But it, I mean, it really goes back, Steve, to the 80s when my dad worked at Radio Shack. And I got to play with remote control cars and build computers. And, you know, if you guys remember what a Tandy is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Tandys and IBMs and Apple IIs. Those were things I got to mess with as a kid. And, you know, it's much different from like a Best Buy nowadays where you just buy the stuff, you know, you had to build like parts and diodes. That was fun. So that's, that's, that's my nerd, nerd upbringing of my, my family. We're all nerds and programmers and um, my mom's a graphic designer as well. So I, 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 that rubbed off on me as well, but I've also worked in the traditional sports industry for about 20 years. Uh, in NCAA, NAIA, uh, YMCA, Parks and Rec, Chamber of Commerce, Sports Commissions. And about three years ago, uh, while working at the Sports Commission here in Kansas City, I uh, started thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm helping bring these football events in, I'm helping bring soccer events, and they're staying in hotels, and they're <laughs> using the space, and you know, buying food and tourism, right? <clears throat> well, I said, man, we, we could really use our conference space and have a uh, a game, a board gaming convention. That'd be cool. Let's do a board game convention. And then what about gaming? Is that a thing? Is that, a, is that, is that really a thing? And during that time, I started learning about esports and gaming online and streaming and created my own brand and was streaming on Twitch, uh, streaming software and doing graphic design and playing video games. And uh, in my day job, I also started a esports convention that had about 800 people and just started diving in deep into this industry and um, kind of the creation of this foundation was because of that. And that's kind of where I am today. And I can tell you more about the foundation creation and what it's all about too. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. All of us kind of come into this industry from different uh, mm -hmm. areas. My start was actually Pong. I don't know if you oh, nice. go back that far. I was six years old. We came back from living overseas in Singapore, and it was finally something I could beat my brother at, who was six <laughs> years older than me, and, uh, you know, played, I think at then it was dimes, may have been nickels. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember, but I do remember bugging mom and dad for, uh, for coinage so I could go play Pong. <laughs> right. Yeah, the days of the arcade, uh, the days of the arcade were great. Uh, I remember going to the mall. And that was where we spent most of our time. And as, as maybe we'll talk a little, a little more, but I mean, the, the invention of the consoles and personal computers has driven that into, you know, the homes just as much as the pre COVID Netflix has driven us out of AMC movie theaters. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So COVID is uh, kind of interesting. And mm -hmm. what, what do you think that's going to have as far as esports and, and the effect mm -hmm. um, on esports? Well, to, to, to go back to Netflix, I mean, we saw like 75% increase like in the f 1st of April on streaming services and stocks and toilet paper, toilet paper stocks and, you know, futures or whatever. <clears throat> so COVID's had its, had its, um, had its impact in many different ways. Right. And I think with the things that we are all doing now differently, like zoom stocks, right. Like we're on it right now. Uh, when it comes to esports, the resiliency of an activity that can be that can be competition online, and maybe your school shut down, or your uh, your facility that you would play in, or your arena, or your college, or whatever, 
is shut down, it still can live on compared to the stuff, you know, most of us are used to with um, competing in football or soccer or other activities or going to the gym or whatever is, was not able to be um, continued. Uh, now, maybe coaches could give you exercise routines, but you couldn't compete for quite some time. And it's, it's there and it's not there just depending on what's happening right now and in, in, in COVID, but esports is a resilient thing in that sense that it can be done anywhere and everywhere. Uh, it can be done, but it's also a have and have nots issue. And that's kind of the big thing with our foundation is to make sure those have nots have an equal playing field uh, or a, or a map, I should say in esports uh, equal playing map. So those students can have access in the inner city because there's a lot of things like digital redlining where I grew up inner city and I didn't have the same access that my friends did in suburbs. So esports has its opportunities. There's big money and there's a lot of flashiness to it, but it's it's in in estimates, it's either $2 billion industry or $25 billion industry, depending on what you include out of a $160 billion industry. So it's just a sexy term right now, but it's still still pretty resilient. So what are the common misconceptions that people have? You know, we have probably a mixed audience here. Some maybe parents say maybe educators. What what are some of the misconceptions you see in this arena? Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that question. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up my screen here and share this. Uh, just to give some visuals. So if you can see, let me know. Yeah. So what we've got is, you know, the American Psychological Association actually reaffirms some information they put out a while ago about there's no correlation and connection between violent games and how uh, kids interact or violence in schools or violence in adolescent because <laughs> they reaffirmed it because there's a lot of loud people saying loud things for the past 10 years about how video games cause violence. Well, we actually had two, I guess we still have two presidential candidates, so supposedly, <laughs> that have both in the past 10 years said school shootings are caused by video games. There's been no link, been no link found. Uh, we also look at screen time. Oxford has a study about the relationship between aggressive behavior and the time spent played as a teenager uh, playing video games. No link. Now, those are important factors to think about that also tie into things like uh, ratings for games. So, I mean, Steve, you, you guys got kids, right? Yeah. So, uh, I'm not, uh, maybe I'm not the best sometimes on what they should watch. We kind of try to go to common sense media. I got 11, a nine, and a five-year-old, and they're all boys, and they're crazy, and the house always smells. But <laughs> the, the idea that <clears throat> I'm going to not let them watch Halloween or Freddy Krueger is something we kind of know, right? As an 11 year old, I'm not gonna let him do that. I don't know when I'll let him watch that or if he will, but there's game ratings too. There's game ratings on things like Fortnite. Minecraft actually is a 10 plus game. So now not to ivory tower here, my, my, my five-year-old and nine-year-old has played Minecraft, but it's also based on your own values in your household, right? So maybe my 11 year old can play Fortnite next year based on it's a 12 year old rated game for, for what it has, even though it's cartoon shooting. Um, maybe, I, maybe as a value system I have, I don't want to let it play until it's 15. It just depends. But those are guidelines to follow and help. And so when you see um, games like Rocket League, which is an E for everyone game, it's, it's soccer with cars. And I know we, they t you guys talked about that yesterday, Jay, on your, on your, uh, on your video. It's yes. yeah, it's it's a widely accepted game because it's it's fun and it's soccer and it's sport, you know, it's it's sport related. So those are some big things when we talk about objections and misconceptions when it comes to video games. So how would a facility get started with an esports program? Well, there's a there's a couple different things here to think about. Uh, if we're talking facility, we have many verticals. Right, we have uh, the scholastic space, and we have the community space, and we have maybe a professional space as well as I mean something you guys did, Harmon. You guys did the the esports arena, which is an amazing arena. It's in the Luxor, right? Yeah, is that right? Yeah, out yeah. in Vegas. Yeah, that thing's amazing. Um, it's a it's a gold standard in the in the industry for with HyperX and the esports arena, and what you guys did was great. So you got these different verticals. And how do you get started? Well, is you can honestly do scholastic esports for free. 
So if you think about this, we recommend as a foundation, you know, we're a nonprofit charity. We're all about esports literacy, trying to help engage schools to have the opportunity to succeed through esports. Because, and I'll definitely talk about it later uh, about the the benefits of esports in schools. But in a scholastic space, you as a teacher or a uh, sponsor at a school or even a coach can put a flyer out and say, hey, we're going to have a Smash Brothers tournament, which is Mario Brothers fighting like Street Fighter uh, with Nintendo Switch. Bring your Nintendo Switches to the library and we're going to raise money for the local hospital. And that's a free thing that you can run as an administrator or a, a teacher. Because what you'll do is you'll put that flyer out expecting 10 kids and you make it 50, which is a very common thing, especially middle school, high school. Now, what, what can you... Um, do to get started on other levels <clears throat> well there's competitive nature with middle school and high school and collegiate in the sense of leagues and online competitive play there's many great leagues here in the united states ones we partner with high school esports league middle school esports league national junior college athletic association esports uh, csl tespa nace there's a lot of great organizations that are doing it they're doing it outside the school space not not to be compared with your state a sanctioned football team uh, kind of league, but there's, that's because it's not sanctioned yet. There's a lot of, lot of work to do there, but it's being accepted. And I will say there's 3,000 high schools, over 3,000 high schools in the United States, North America, I should say, that have esport clubs. So if you're wondering, hey, we can't do this. Well, you've probably got a, you know, an old board member who looks like an older version of me that doesn't know how to work a cell phone that says, no, you can't do these video games are bad. And that's understandable. They, they probably fought printers and fax machines too, when those came out. So understandably, there's different ways to start and get started. You can use our resources on our website for the scholastic space. When you get into the college space, work with those college teams, the other verticals of professionals, you'd need to find solution providers like groups like AVI, C, uh, uh, SPL, as well as Harmon, work with those folks to provide that professional vertical in the sense of uh, even community-based. If you're trying to have a, a land center or a community center, or maybe something at your library or YMCA, those are, those are easy ways to have, start the conversation at least. That's awesome. What do you see as the major differences? You talked about K through 12 mm -hmm. and a little bit about professional. How does that transition? Is it all mm -hmm. switch and mobile based at the K through 12, or do you see some consoles mixed mm -hmm. in there too? That's a great question. Well, I go back to accessibility, right? For the haves and the have nots. Um, consoles typically are more affordable. PCs can, gaming PCs can be more expensive and need updates. Uh, but, but that's okay. Hello, IT. <laughs> yeah. In the, in the school space, that's, that's a, that's a constant thing, but that's, that's why groups like yours and resellers and uh, providers will want to work on those things to have uh, upgradable um, options throughout the year and the and life of a PC. And when we talk about the middle school space, yeah, it's more console. And, uh, but really we look at the, if we go to the professional scene from top down, they're playing high powered gaming PCs to compete and win scholarships and dollars and prizes and millions of dollars. There are some consoles in those same plays like Fortnite has both cross play, uh, but really like the Call of Duty League is based on console. So when we look at this, this whole uh, spectrum, there's a couple things to think about. You've got console for different games only, you've got cross play, you've got PC only in different games. You've also got accessibility issues and you've also got publishers and game uh, developers who also hold a lot of power. So they hold a lot of power because if we kind of look at accessibility and break down console versus PC, um, console is more affordable and also marketed more towards uh, a, a different demographic than uh, what I look like, right? And it's the unfortunate part is you when I go to conferences, let's just say I go to big conventions like gaming conventions, DreamHack Atlanta last year, the Fortnite and the Smite and the big PC-based games had huge stages and lights and sound and really cool stuff. And $1,000 prize packages, $10,000 prize packages. And the money was coming from Fortnite, coming down. 
you look over and you see these old CRT monitors and like flat panel, uh, you know, TV screens, you know, HDMI screens or, you know, audio video plugs and old, you know, like Nintendos and Xboxes. And it's all the people just having the time of their life playing Madden or, you know, speed running Mario. And then there's no real prize money because the publishers and what they're pushing down and providing is, is a very interesting model. And at, like I said, we talked about digital redlining. There's, there's, there's a systemic issue here within gaming, but I'll say in the whole pipeline, the, it's not the same as traditional sports. We want to, we want to really say it is, we want to say LeBron could have been a five-year-old, you know, dunking and now he's a pro player at 18 and now, you know, different, we got, you know, got to go to a year of college, but that's not exactly the same for esports in that pipeline. There's a lot of opportunity for you to go to college and earn scholarships and then move on. But you can't really move on from college to pro as you you think you should, just like NFL recruits would. And not the same in esports. In esports, you're getting recruited at 13 by with a million dollar contract to live in a house with a chef and uh, a personal trainer, and then you're getting burned out by 18, unfortunately, and living off for your retirement. It's or, a real weird industry. Or you go to industry. work for Harmon or AVISPL as an engineer. So, now yeah. you know about when, all this when you When you get done, you can now get hired by these great companies. <laughs> it's, it. it, that's like your, uh, that's like the, you know, the Emmett Smiths or the, uh, the Troy Aikman's becoming, or, you know, Tony Romo's becoming the, the commentators. Yeah. You know, yeah. You get out. Yep. Yeah. So that, and, mm -hmm. And, and I, th I think that's very appropriate for what we're talking about. Not everybody is going to become professional, but it's still very much a value for these kids coming up, whether they become that 0.01% to, to make mm -hmm. a living as an actual player or as a coach or as an AV nerd installing these systems in huge arenas that are just massive entertainment complexes mm -hmm. doing esports. Yeah, 100%. So what do you think is your one piece of practical advice if, if you're a person in the audience here and you're an mm -hmm. educator and you think, man, this, this sounds cool, but how do I, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for me just getting started? Where, sure. where would I go? Sure. Love it. Uh, this is what I get to talk about every day. Your kids are already playing video games. Okay. Why not make it productive? And especially in the school sense, um, especially this year, you know, we talked about COVID. Um, you know, why school esports? Let's just talk about the scholastic space. Well, we know that there's 97% of teens already playing video games. So that's, that's just about everybody, right? And if you want to meet them where they are and provide some belonging, well, let's talk about the subset of kids that we have surveyed that participate in esport clubs and this free curriculum that we have that I'll show you here in a second. When we survey them, 82% of them say, I don't participate in any other activities at school. So if you think about that subset of kids who potentially isn't going to play an instrument, isn't going to uh, participate in a sport, they all play video games. The, the valedictorian, the band geek, the football player jock, they all play video games because we know 97% of them play. So why not give those kids that don't have an activity a way to get involved and engage? Um, gray matter involvement. There's a lot of research about uh, helping uh, health and well-being, uh, improving your memory. I said the industry's huge, $25 billion industry. You know, is eSport a sport? Can we talk about that? Maybe it should have been called e-activity. I don't know, in 2000 when StarCraft was huge. The jobs around it, this is how you can advance the industry in eSports. There's jobs. Take out players and games right here and put in NBA. These have these jobs. Commentator, journalist, business developers, web developers. It's a low cost entry kind of uh, activity. Um, really for a school, instead of a football player uh, costing $500 per student to have that football player play the activity, the schools could spend $250 uh, competing in a um, online competition, esports uh, uh, competition. There's a lot of gamers in the world. Hey, Bubba, we've got mm -hmm. a question on mm -hmm, chat, sure. which is very appropriate to this conversation. And it asks if there's been a lot of talk that conferences like the Big 12 and ACC will not get into esports because of mm -hmm. the ability of players to be paid or to win money. Mm -hmm. 
what what are your uh, what are your thoughts on that as being a me, NCAA me, violation? Well, uh, since I have worked for the NCAA and I have uh, I still teach in the collegiate space, um, and I talk about name, image, and likeness a lot. Um, so it's not an NCAA violation right now because there's no sanctioning. Um, so let's think of a uh, let's think of when Patrick Mahomes played at Texas Tech. Let's say he plays at Texas Tech right now. He's not for the Chiefs. And I like Patrick Mahomes because, you know, Kansas City. Let's say he's – I can't think of a college football co- co- quarterback right now. Let's say Patrick Mahomes is still in college and uh, he's playing right now in regular season. Today, he could go, or even this weekend, he could go and compete in an eSports tournament online or down the road at, a, at the Texas Tech Coliseum or something and win $1,000. Well – NCAA has no way of saying you can't do that because it's not tied to the same sport he plays Uh and it's not a violation based on that huge thick you know NCAA guideline book that all the athletes have to sign that sign their soul away and so there's no violation there NCAA is real wide and expansive on this but very uh, very inconsistent Uh, a tennis player that's uh, playing in big 12 ACC they can go and compete in a live, an actual um, tennis tournament outside of school, but they can only accept like X amount of dollars of those winnings until they have to say, I can't accept anymore. But that's the same sport compared to football players. You can go play, you know, pro baseball or whatever, right? Well, and and there's also a big difference between, you know, K through 12 and college competitions. Mm -hmm. And then once you go pro, because a lot of the college ones are on scholarships. So that's, Mm -hmm. do they still get paid prize money if they're- It, it, okay. there, there is the only governing body in the college space right now that's not a uh, that's an actual governing body is the NJCAA, the Junior College Athletic Association, is the only collegiate uh, governing body that has sanctioned esports. Hmm. NCAA one, two, even NAI hasn't sanctioned it, even though Br- uh, Michael Brooks at NACE has works with the NAI. The NAI hasn't sanctioned esports as an actual sport or an actual activity for that matter. So the the players and, and to get back to the NJ doubles uh, in the National Junior College Athletic Association, there's still no, no regulation on money that can be brought in. So right now, uh, what I love about the collegiate uh, esports space is, and, and coming from a guy who worked in marketing in the Big Twelve, um, I, I didn't get paid. Uh, for a while, I was just kind of getting hot dog coupons because I was r- I was running around the stadium with my microphone, yelling and doing stuff on the basketball court, playing uh, you know musical chairs, and like that was fun for me because I love being an idiot. But the I was getting paid in c- coupons um, when the esports teams at colleges that have varsity programs that are providing scholarships or tuition discounts. In most cases, uh, they're helping those students pay tuition. And they're getting some degree with whatever they want. That's sometimes it's stimulated, which is awesome. But they're, they're also uh, giving scholarships to the AV and the IT and the social media managers. This isn't, yeah. this isn't something that was happening. There you go. Yeah, this wasn't something that was happening when I was in athletics. I didn't get a scholarship because I ran around with a mic. Maybe I was, if I was a graduate assistant as a coach, I could have, but that's not what's happening in the esports space. So it's, it's very new and broad and there's no regulation on it. So there's no ceiling right now, but the name, image, and likeness thing that's going to really hit in 2021, which should have hit this year, is going to have a big effect on uh, NCAA not being upset because you made a penny on your YouTube channel like they have been in the past 15 years. Yeah. Well, and it'll be interesting to see if they can figure out how to monetize it. You know, if they can figure out how to, you know, a lot of the broadcast right now is the internet, which NCAA and, and ACC, they can't do really anything mm-hmm. about. As soon as they could have it where it's a pay for view or something like that in the finals, now they might be a whole lot more interested in. Uh, as soon as the NCAA can find a way to make money off it, they will do it. It's amazing how that works <laughs> in, in the world, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so so uh, we're about out of time. Any passing you know, comments, anything from the audience, any questions, maybe, uh, maybe talk about some of the links of where you, yeah. uh, where you yeah. can go for help. Yeah. Please check us out at varsity esports foundation.org. This right here is free curriculum. It is the world's only comprehensive textbook for gaming and esports 
created by a principal and a teacher in Wichita, Kansas. And you can download this on our website. It's also a part of Microsoft Educator. It's STEM accredited. Um, you can download it right here, click it, and you get this 148 page textbook right to your, uh, right to your uh, browser. Um, it's partnered with, we're, it's partnered with Microsoft Education Community. You can earn a badge as an esports uh, educator. And it's, I, what I love about this is in 40 different countries, it's been downloaded over 200,000 times because people are using, using it up. And I love it because it was provided for free. So people could start using, um, using the tools. And it's, and the, the, the great thing about it, it's not just here's how to play video games. It's um, healthy activities. It's wrist exercises. It's, um, you know, uh, food pyramid, uh, how to go to college. Um, I'll, I'll definitely some videos that I'll kind of mention here. The, the question, um, we also have a, a department of ours called the Esports Education Network. And Stephen this week has taken our awesome K-12 Esports Provider Certification that you can take with a partnership we have with DNH. And you can definitely check that out. It's a fun two and a half hour course. But our Esports Education Network has these really simple, free courses. What is esports? Okay, you want to know you you want to give this to your uh, kind of crazy uncle on Thanksgiving and they don't get it and why your <laughs> kids play video games? Do the what is esports course? Why it matters in schools is the second course. The third course is how to start a club in esports. We got everything you need to know and how to earn scholarships. And then um, lastly, I'm going to throw in uh, that since we're a nonprofit charity foundation, public charity, we provide grants and scholarships. So. We're always happy to take donations to support the fund so we can give more access to those schools that want eSport clubs that then can get sold to have more equipment for their schools. Um, so you can apply online and uh, for those grants and those uh, fin financial assistance and kids you know could earn scholarships to go to college. Part of your training talked about the, uh, the kids that find eSports and it's interesting that those kids are not traditionally kids in sports. So these are mm -hmm, kids mm -hmm. that were like me. They were a nerd. They didn't fit mm -hmm. in. They didn't know what group they belonged to. And, you know, esports is a way to get them out from hiding, you know, mm -hmm. playing in their in their bedroom and being antisocial to really going out and, and engaging and, and learning mm -hmm. how to participate. Yeah. You know, you know, any activity that a kid who's not in something then gets into something is going to help with community with belonging, uh, GPA and attendance. But luckily, when we've actually got data on this, that that curriculum that if, if schools are have eSport high schools, high schools, and middle schools, if they're using eSports curriculum that we provide for free, and they're playing in an eSports club, they're getting that community, they're getting that team building. Um, they're not all players, there's going to be I, a AV kid, there, there's going to be a streamer, there's going to be a commentator, there's going to be the IT kid. Um, the, there, there's more than just one role. Just like in basketball, there's a an equipment manager and a staff person. You have all these different roles for students. They're not just the gamers. And that is college and career readiness through the lens of esports. And so any activity can do these things, but you're meeting those kids where they are when they don't have something. Plus, the data we've got that this uh, these clubs and this curriculum has actually seen an increase in attendance for kids of ten percent and a GPA increase of 1.7. So it's it's providing that belonging that these kids need that don't fit in in other places. And there's nothing wrong with that uh, AT, IT and AV nerd. Hey, <laughs> I'm, right. I'm one of them. Right? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, J2 and golly, how, ma how many other AV sales guys and system designers play video games and uh, That's right. you know, might be in a different career path if we weren't all in our 50s? <laughs> just saying there you go absolutely well guys yeah. this has been a really really good session and it's it's great to meet you Bubba and uh, yeah. certainly thank you for sharing the resources that that you've uh, that you brought to the table today as well and and Steve get a lot of questions about the um, about you know like how do you start a e-club or I'm sorry an esports club and that type of thing um, I understand that there's some resources that you've got here at today's show yeah, so uh, Bubba's putting them up in the chat. Um, I attended Bubba's class. Connor is the uh, instructor. He was a guy out there doing it. He's a guy out there coaching, and uh, I, I found his uh, insight to be very helpful. Great. 
Awesome. Well, very good. Well, this has been a great session and I hope everybody enjoyed it. We will also make sure that this uh, is uh, recorded and is available to be viewed at any time on demand. Um, just make sure that you stop by the Harmon booth and make sure that you've got some great resources there. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we look forward to working together on future projects together. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thanks, Jake. Thanks. You bet.